Hey, hey, everybody, it's Eddie from Tokyo. This is your cryptocurrency update from Japan. And Bloomberg let out a rumor which has an unconfirmed source. So I'm very careful to spread that rumor. But they say that they heard someone in Japan is going to launch a BTC ETF. And if there really is a Bitcoin ETF coming, I would like to know who is doing it. Is it somebody that we are very familiar with? Or is it a new player? So I'm going to get to work uh, trying to find some credible sources to back that up. Usually Bloomberg has some good sources. So I think where there's smoke, there's fire. And chances are somebody is cooking up something. I have some friends here in Japan, too, that I will ask in the certain circles, which may be able to find something out. I'll ask them for some help, so we'll see what we can drum up. But here, I want to talk about this story because it is all over the news today because the Japanese program or documentary style on NHK mentioned Cardano and ADA. And yes, they did at the 57-minute mark, and it's great, and I think it's wonderful. But truly, the wonderful thing about this program, which is 75% in English, so it is done by a Japanese producer. Okay, so 25% is in Japanese. You won't get it, but 75% is done in English. I think you will understand the gist of it. It's very typical NHK, so which means high quality, very intellectual, and they take a neutral stance, but looking at a very wide spectrum of people within the uh, technology, black, blockchain, and virtual currency space. It's very, oh, it's very good. It's an hour and 38 minutes long. It talks about trade, technology, the uh, dangers of economic nationalism, and the harmful undermining of the of these kinds of trends that could actually disrupt peace. And it touches on the um, dangers of war economies. So I really strongly, if you're interested in those topics, I ask you to watch it because uh, just, just don't worry about the 25% you can't understand and focus on the 75% that you can understand because the people that they chose to interview, which uh, they speak in English, are really quite interesting. In fact, I learned something new. There is an acronym out there going around called GAFA, G-A-F-A, -A, and what it refers to is Google, Amazon, Facebook, and Apple. And these big domineering verticals which monopolize the uh, industries in which they're in provide us God, love, consumption and sex. And it's very interesting to hear this person when they talk about those four companies and why they are so big because of what they are able to provide in the way of our desires today in this world. It's just it's very, very interesting. It can provide some um, doors that open into critical thinking. So I'm going to put the link down in the comment section below and uh, you might enjoy it. And talk about Japanese programming and virtual currencies. There is a regular program now on Thursday nights at 1230 that is all about virtual currencies. So it is also on NHK. It's on their BS11, which is their satellite uh, channel. But anything that comes out in the way of NHK is um, super high quality always. And it has the trust, if you will, of the Japanese public. So the fact that NHK is um, broadcasting this particular weekly program on virtual currencies lends a lot of credibility to the space. And I'm just so happy to see it because I think we're just um, going to have this as one more reason as to how the mass adoption is occurring here in Japan. All right, so Ripple just let us know in the last like 25 hours that RippleNet surpassed 200 customers. And it was announced that 13 new financial institutions have come on board. Oh, it's it's just doesn't stop, right? And but listen to this. We are in the big we are and we're beginning to see more customers flip 
the switch. So we've heard a lot of people in the last year talk about, come on, flip the switch. Well, it is all the customers together in working with leveraging XRP for the on-demand liquidity. That group effort is what is going to flip that switch, not just one entity. So I am glad that that was made clear. And in says here that we are now signing two, sometimes three new customers per week. Okay, let's just do really quick. This is my really quick rough projection. All right. Nothing more than a very, I think, conservative rough projection. Let's take this year, January through April, and let's say they are able to sign 2.5 new customers per week. That brings us to 42. And then when we hit May to August, let's say they do sign three customers per week. That brings us to 51. And if September to November, they're really on a roll and they can do four new customers a week, that will bring us an additional 56. And then December, well, it's always a rough, tough, slow month for business. So let's bring it down to just two customers per week that month. That should bring us a total of 157 new customers with the 200 that are already added. My very rough conservative projection is that we'll see approximately 350 customers by year end 2019. That's my guess. We'll see. All right. One TC. It happens in Berlin this February. It's a place that's kind of uh, intimate in regards to it doesn't have a lot of attendees, just about 420. Uh, does represent people coming from 15 countries in all. It's in the seventh year running. There are 30 speakers, 15 workshops. And the reason why I'm mentioning it is because they have created a debate between Ripple and Swift. So Marjan De, La De Latine, uh, who is the global head of banking in at Ripple, is going to go head to head with Mr. Wim Raymakers. He is the global head of banking market at Swift. Wow, it should be very, very fun. Um, Marjan, get prepared. Come on, do us proud. Get ready. Gambare, as we say in Japanese, do your best. So I think um, here's a snippet of the subject. It will be how will technology affect our daily lives as treasures with the banking sector challenged by new concepts and ideas? Are established banking structures going to be turned on their head? So that's just a snippet they gave us of what they're going to use in this debate. And they use the word debate. So therefore, Marjan, again, get ready, girl, and you show them how we are going to take over their space. All right, so I'm kind of sticking with banks, but moving over to France. So the reports are saying that the yellow vest protesters in France, which according to this person who tweeted, is 70% of the population, they are planning to withdraw all of their money from the banks to destabilize the government. Yikes. It will be nearly 46 million people directly revolting against the banking system. Well, don't underestimate France because they have a history of revolting against their regulatory system and leaders. We don't have to look too far. Here is a very famous painting by Delacroix, and it depicts the French Revolution of 1830. And if you haven't seen this image before, um, take a look, put it into memory. Now let's jump forward to today. Here is a mural that is now done and you can see it's based on that same Delacroix painting except you've got more of a modern version with the revolt of the yellow vest people. It is by a French street artist 
and his name is Pascal Boyard. They call him P-Boy, actually. So you might hear Pascual or you might hear just P-Boy. P-Boy has done something very interesting like BG123 um, uh, does. He has put some sort of riddle to, to solve the clue to get the 1,000 uh, in Bitcoin that's hidden inside this mural. So he says that you can't solve it remotely. It requires the sleuths to visit to decipher the clues physically in person. You have to be in front of it. And I guess this this amount, this BTC amount is actually growing because there are people who can add to the bounty. And I don't know how long it will take before somebody solves it, but um, yeah, you just can't help trying to do it remotely. Uh, I will put a link to the artist Twitter site so you can follow uh, along with this story if it's interesting to you. But it's uh, it's interesting to me that we have uh, the riddles occurring in the Ripple community, and now we've got something very similar going on in uh, street art or mural art in France, still intertwined with virtual currencies. It's very interesting. Okay, so I'm going right to the fluff now. And I'm going to talk about the street art or murals that are in Japan. It's not legal to graffiti, but if the graffiti is more in line with what is considered street art, people don't complain and people don't remove it. So over the course of the more than 15 years I've been here, I saw a country that virtually had no street graffiti at all to now unbelievable tours to go photograph the graffiti art in Tokyo. And it's just not Tokyo. It is all of Japan from top to bottom, east to west, countryside, city. It is really becoming quite a thing. And the artists are becoming very famous. And here is an example. This is Tenazul Isle. This is not far from my house. It's the um, uh, area in to near Tokyo Bay, what's up against Tokyo Bay, that is the shipping and receiving dock area, almost, if you will. It sits in Shinagawaku, and it has a lot of warehouses, although there are some very fancy high-rise apartments now because the view is really spectacular overlooking, well, either either overlooking over the water to Odaiba or looking on the backside onto um, downtown Minatoku. It's just spectacular views all the way around. And um, look at this. I'm just going to show you some of the art just in this one neighborhood. So wherever you can find some space, you will find some art. Look at that. That's wild, huh? And this is so beautiful. It's very, um, yeah, the colors are great. It has a little bit of an abstract floral design. I love it. I just love it. Here is another one that's quite fun. And this one I think is spectacular. Look at that. Dragon and tiger. Anyway, you can um, sign up for walking tours of the street art in Tokyo. I'll put a link to one of those tour companies. I'm not recommending that one because there's many that you can choose from, but at least it'll get you started. So if you come to Japan and you're interested in this and you're interested in photographing it, that's how some of these tours are really set up to do is they're encouraging you to come and of course bring your camera and use it as a chance to um, capture these images on your own camera. Okay, and even some artists are coming to Japan and creating street art because I think it's becoming well known that if it's high quality and it's artistic, uh, it will be left alone and nobody will touch it. And that is sometimes kind of the good thing here in Japan too, is that 
um, people are not going to tag on top of it if it looks nice. People have a lot of respect for the artist and they just let it be. And uh, this is an example actually of an artist from Spain who did this piece on the um, wall in Tokyo. And this is actually one out in the countryside uh, in Gifu. The artist is really super famous and it was one of the more popular pieces that got a lot of attention. This is really just, I think it's great expression. And it's another form of artistic um, expression that I really encourage, especially if you are talking about um, concrete walls and buildings that just don't look so beautiful. I mean, why not? Seems like a great solution to beautify a city. And this city has a lot of concrete, let me tell you. So there's a lot of open canvases just waiting to be beautified. Okay, everybody, that's all I have for you today. Please take care. Sayonara for now. Bye-bye.